one cause monomaniacs like Coles, who was presenting a weapons system, or indeed a weapons mounting system, as the answer to all the problems the Navy had. And so the great battle between the two men developed and was resolved in an extraordinary way, where the Admiralty actually allowed Cowper Coles to have his own ship design built, the famous, maybe the notorious HMS captain. Edward Reed was far from happy with this arrangement. The Admiralty was building a ship which he had not designed, which he had not certified, which he had not tested, and without seeking or indeed taking his opposition to the project on board. In 1870, Reed resigned over the affair. But the drama was far from over. The captain ended up proving that Cowper Coles was not much of a hand at designing ships. The turrets, logically displaced, under a flying bridge, but the freeboard here was little more than eight feet as designed and only six and a half feet as completed, as the ship was rather heavier than intended. The admirals had misgivings and wrote to the builders. I am commanded by the Admiralty to call your attention to the fact that the stipulated draft of water at the captain has been exceeded by 22 inches at least, and that the qualities of this ship may be prejudicially affected by this error. On a second cruise with the Channel Fleet, Cowper Coles was actually on board to witness the triumph of his masterpiece. And one dark night off Cape Finisterre, the ship was proceeding under sail with a fairly full set of canvas spread from these enormous masts when she was struck by a gale. The gale went through the fleet, breaking rigging, damaging masts, and breaking the yards from which the sails were hung. But in the case of Captain, the rig held up and the gale simply blew the ship over onto her side. She filled and she sank, taking with her all but a handful of her crew. The incompatibility of the turret principle with low freeboard and these enormous masts destroyed the ship, her company, and her inventor. It was perhaps ironic, but fortunate that Cole should go down with this ship and never be seen again. The loss of the captain was a national tragedy, but it brought an emerging problem into sharp focus. Building a warship was the single most expensive project a government could undertake, yet much was left to chance in all new designs. Not until the ship was launched and tested could the design be deemed a success. One of the key results of the Captain disaster was the removal of amateur influence from ship design. Reed had already established the scientific basis of modern ship design. It was then reinforced by the work of William Froude, who introduced hydrodynamic testing in a model tank. William Froude had been brought in by Reed to work on his latest battleship. It was Froude's idea to make wax scale models and to test them for performance, both at sea and in test tanks. This more scientific approach helped produce one of the milestone battleships. Even before Captain entered service, Edward Reed decided the answer was to get rid of the masts and to build a pure steamship. And this, HMS Devastation, would be his masterpiece, entering service in the early 1870s with her turrets fore and aft, two 25-ton guns in each, a pair of funnels for steam engines, and a mast simply to carry signals and to indicate her nationality. But the turrets are mounted significantly higher than they were in the Captain. Reed developed the principle which he called the breastwork monitor, separating her from Ericsson's original by carrying the turrets further up in the ship so that the guns actually had a higher command and were less likely to be swamped by the sea. With devastation, launched in 1871, the modern battleship was beginning to emerge. And a year later, pressure from Reed on Froude's behalf resulted in the construction of the world's first marine test tank. Built in Torquay, England, it established a practice of marine hull testing that was quickly adopted worldwide and remains the principal means of predicting a ship's behavior at sea.
Froude's contribution allowed people to have much greater confidence in the design of ships. They could actually be tested in a realistic, measurable way under ideal conditions. The modern warship was all but complete, but with one significant shortcoming, engine power. As guns got bigger, armor got thicker, and the warship got heavier. Bigger and bigger engines required more coal to cover shorter distances. The warship was heading for a technological impasse. The man to provide a breakthrough was a true genius of his age, Charles Parsons. Inspired by an ancient Greek device called the aeropile, he used a jet of high-pressured steam to spin an intricate set of propeller blades, thus creating a very high-speed engine, or turbine. Parsons successfully used his new engine to power electricity generators. But he had a bigger dream to build the fastest ship on Earth. Parsons began work designing a yacht. No shipbuilder himself, he got others to do the building. But the means of propulsion would be his new turbine, so he named her Turbinia. After a great deal of planning, she was finally ready for testing on the Tyne River. Parsons' turbine was a high-speed, high-powered engine, theoretically capable of high performance. But in test after test, it failed to live up to expectations. When he installed his steam turbine, he was very disappointed because he couldn't achieve even 20 knots, whereas he was hoping to achieve 30 to 40 knots with the steam turbine. Tests show that this was nothing to do with the turbine, but it was the propeller that was at fault. And being bright, he then decided to try the propellers. And this showed that cavitation was the problem. One of the real problems of the propeller, as engines got more powerful and whirled round more and more, was cavitation, effectively bubbles of steam being created by the force of the propeller turning in the water. When your cavitation is bad, the power no longer is put into the water, so it's counterproductive. You can have as powerful an engine as you want, but you can't transmit the power to the water. Solving the problems of cavitation was really as important as developing the engines themselves. In pursuit of a solution, Parsons had invented the cavitation tunnel. OK, I think that looks nice. You're looking at a really, in my terminology, is a very nice uh, full-developed cavitation in terms of the um, tip vortex as well as the sheet vortex. You can see that the Parson sheet vortex... realized the density of the truss or the power generated uh, by the propeller shouldn't be that great. To prevent this problem, you simply introduce more, more blade area, if you like, to the propeller, or distribute the power into more than one shaft, if you like. So indeed, Parson put three turbines and then transmitted the power to three shafts. Indeed, he went further, and each shaft he put three propellers. So tandem three propellers, he ended up with nine propellers instead of one large big single propeller, but solving the problem. Parsons' dream was about to become a reality. His next move was the most spectacular and the most controversial of his brilliant career. The year was 1897, and all the crown heads of Europe were gathering off Portsmouth to celebrate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. The venue was the annual Fleet Review, All of a sudden, through the seaborne ranks of royalty and heads of state, stormed the little Turbinia. As she tore past the columns of cruisers and battleships, the Times reporter observed, 
With deliberate disregard of authority, Turbinia gave herself an advertisement by steaming at astonishing speed between the lines. The patrol boats, which attempted